Chris, thank you so much for being here today on the podcast. Really appreciate your time, uh, taking the time out of your day. I know you have a busy and crazy schedule to, to join us on this podcast today. Delighted to be here, Stephen. Thank you so much for inviting me. You bet. And, and Chris, everyone I talk to um, who knows you, and a lot of my family members know you or, and, and people that have worked with you, they've said nothing but positive and amazing things about you. They say that you're one of the most energetic, uh, authentic people they've ever been around. Um, and so, I, again, thrilled and honored to have you on the podcast and, and to talk a little, little bit about the book um, that you wrote and, and co-wrote, uh, The Four Disciplines of Execution. So I want to get into each of the disciplines, obviously, but one of the first things I wanted to ask you about was kind of the context behind the book itself. Mm -hmm. So, so why, why write a book around quest, uh, uh, execution? You know, what, what is the pain that this is addressing? So early on, a um, gentleman by the name of Ram Sharan, uh, some some of your 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 listeners might might know that name. Wrote a book called Execution about uh, a little over twenty years ago, and he he was friends with um, several members of your family and and our CEO at the time, Bob Whitman. And he asked us um, two questions that changed the course of our organization and set us on this track. And the questions revolved around leadership. And obviously, as a as a leadership development firm. Like we were pretty dialed in. His first question was, um, "What do leaders study? Do leaders, when they go to school, do leaders study strategy or do leaders study execution?" And we all said, "Well, we study strategy." And then his second question got us. And his second question is, "What do they struggle with?" And in our experience, and we, and you know, it was clear that yeah, they. I mean, there's issues on the strategic side, but they really struggle in execution. And then the more we looked at it, what we started to realize was the dynamics around that struggle revolved around human nature. And they were, they were human characteristics and challenges that really created very, very real problems with um, execution. And that we sort of fell in love with that problem and have been on this path for about 20 years. That that's great to hear the background of it, and and I'm curious, like what what was the process behind writing the book? I know that you didn't just throw out a process and say, okay, this is how you do it. I mean, you, there was a lot of research behind it, right? And there and there was a lot of testing too, right? I love that you are asking me this question. <laughs> um, my model for this was your grandfather. When I started, um, and I and I just we just mentioned before the podcast started that I was. Um, uh, Stephen R. Covey's publicist for a short time in, in 91. And when I, when I started working for your grandfather, one of the things I, I realized was he didn't set out to write a book. Seven Habits may be the most influential personal development business book of all times. You could argue it's in the top three for sure. This was a, this was a methodology that he had baked for over a decade before he wrote the book. Right, so he starts in '76. You know, it's not until the late '80s, and then they they have to decide whether they will write a book. There was many people in the early Covey Leadership Center that didn't want to write a book; they didn't want to give it away. And so the methodology had baked for a decade, and and I think that's one of the reasons it was so powerful. So so back to your question, Stephen, we did the same thing. We were trying to solve the problem, not write a book. We had over three thousand organizational implementations of this methodology for a decade. And people kept asking me, are you going to write a book? Is there a book? This is really good kind. There should be a book. And all I could think about was your grandfather. I'm like, we're not ready. We're not ready. We're not ready. And so starting in 2002, the book is published in 2012. And, and yeah, there was some heavy duty research up front, but the real engine behind it was trial and error, scientific method, hypothesis testing. Yeah, and I, that's what I love about this book is is you find so many books that are written today that is maybe just one person's opinion and not necessarily backed by real world experience. And I think that's that's the power of this book in particular. They always try and hide it. They have like little yeah. clever tricks that they use, and that's not I mean, that's not everybody. It's not every book, but you're right. There's so many that that you sort of get that sense, and, and we didn't want to be we did not want to be in that in that category, and um. 
yeah, these were, this was more about mistakes and learning from mistakes than anything else, I, I, I believe. One of the things when you read the book, it's definitely geared towards organizations and companies, the way that the book is written. But one question before we jump into more specifics yeah. is since it's based on timeless principles, I mean, really this, this, the disciplines where you, you talk about can be applied to an individual on an individual level, yep. or, you know, maybe, maybe a family level, yep. uh, team level, whatever. I mean, is that what's been your experience around, you know, kind of the organization side, obviously, and then personal, you know, personal side. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. The context was always um, the, the setting in that organizational challenge of a leader that's got to accomplish a goal or a task in that organizational setting. But since all of the problems associated with execution <laughs> were of a human nature, right? Not only were the principles universal, but they dealt with human nature. So as, as we get into this, um, keep taking me back to the personal application. There's just a few little tweaks um, if applied that, that make this just as relevant if you're an army of one as if you're running a team or you're running an organization. Right, yeah. So when, when we go through the disciplines, I, I have two things in mind. One's a, a professional one and one's like more of a personal one. Oh, good. <laughs> so, good. so hopefully we can, I, I can understand it better myself. So, but before we jump into those, just a couple more questions around. So is, is execution, it, from your experience and, and research, is execution a people problem or is it more of like a systems problem? Because oh, I've, heard, I've heard various things and, and I just, yeah. It's really interesting. We really went into this thinking it was a systemic problem, right? But the issues, and we'll point them out. So as we go into the disciplines, I'll tell you there's, there's a particular human tendency that undoes execution with all of these disciplines. And it's one of the reasons the disciplines are a little counterintuitive. So the problem really is very, very human. So the quick answer to your question is it's human, not systemic. Well, here's the ironic part about your question. The fix is systemic. So, you know, there's a great quote. If you, if you read Atomic Habits, there's a great quote yep. that he has where he says, uh, we, don't, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We, we fall to the level of our systems. And so, so it, it's a, you know, yes, the problem's human, but th there's a systemic fix to the human problem. So, and I don't know if that's not, I'm not sure that's 100% clear, but that's how, I pro that's how I process your question. Appreciate that insight. It's just something I know it's debated a lot. And, and from what I've learned and been around and seen, it seems like in a company that, that, that systems play a huge role when it comes to execution, right? And it's easy to blame the people and blame, okay, it's their problem. Um, you know, they have the issue. Yeah. But when in reality, as a leader, I think you have to look at it as, okay, this is, uh, you know, this is a systems problem. Um, so a lot of times we, we, um, we love this quote from, uh, uh, Edwards Deming that anytime the majority of people behave a particular way, the majority of the time, the problem is not the people, the problems in the system. So I like, like we, we go to that school. Um, but if you want to create systems that actually get you the result you're looking for, you got to understand some dynamics about human nature that are not immediately self-evident. So the two are sort of the two are sort of intertwined um, pretty tightly. Um, but then, yeah, we'll get into it, and then let's maybe come back to this question because it, it sure. might be easier to talk about this once we sort of once we sort of uh, you know go a little deeper. Okay, and then yeah, before we get in the first discipline, the last one I wanted to, I, I feel like it's important to set the context is yeah, in the book you, you in the book you talk about um, the the world the whirlwind and kind of uh, how it can be at odds with the strategic goals of yeah. of an organization. So I wonder if you might I think if we explain what the whirlwind is, then we can get into the disciplines. Yeah, I, I think found, that's I a found really that powerful. important thing yeah. to do. Yeah, this is really important because this really answers the question about what we're solving for, right? So it, at, the, at a very high level, you could say, yeah, execution's hard. Yeah, well, we all get it. 
But if, if you go just a little bit deeper, I'm executions hard. And this, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to explain it this way. There's a, there's a sort of a universal human tendency for an individual, every individual, you, everyone, you know, right. To want to move to something urgent, even at the expense of something far more important. And this is rooted right in Stephen R. Covey's methodology, right? In habit three around the difference. And we sort of came back to this principle. We kept bumping into it that, that in the moment, right? And everybody's experienced this, right? You could be working on the most important project of the year and you're, everything inside of you wants to go put out some little fire, right? And you know what? I must be crazy. This is so important. Why is this so hard for me to stay on this, right? And we, we compensate for this but we keep fighting this tendency to move towards the urgent. So we think, well, maybe it's not a huge deal. Oh, you recognize what a huge deal it is when you put it in the context of what every leader is doing. See, once you, once you think about what's ha happening, that there's this, and now, now I'll introduce the term whirlwind. If you think about all the energy required to maintain any operation, or on a personal level, just to maintain your life, all the energy required to just get through the day, right? Uh, all the energy required to keep the doors open on, on, on an operation. That day job, what we call the whirlwind, is soaking in urgency. Everything about it is, is immediate, right? The goals for the organization almost never, only under the most dire circumstances, do they match the urgency of the day job. So it, leaders get very frustrated and confused when everyone agrees with them on the strategy. And they spend all this time trying to convince people that if you just understood our strategic intent, you'd do it, right? And I just, maybe if I just tell them one more time, if I just explained it one more, if I'll just, I'll tell them again, right? And, and they all agree and they're like, key to our future boss, love it. And no one's doing anything. And these leaders are losing their minds. And what's happening is in the moment, I love it. Great boss. I got to get back though. Right. I'm, I'm dying here. I'm, I'm drowning. Let me just, let me just, you keep thinking chief. That's what you're good at. Right. And this, like, when you say this to a group of leaders and even before they know four disciplines, the term whirlwind immediately becomes part of the vocabulary, the nomenclature of that culture, because, because that word just explains whirlwind and we can be busy all week long. And we're no closer to our goals than we were when we started. So that dynamic, when you explain that dynamic to leaders, they're like, okay, I'm listening now. You got something for that? All right. And so, so this little problem, this little urgency fix we have, when you put it in the context of trying to get a strategy done, it really, people go, yeah, that last strategy that died, it didn't come down with a loud crash. It suffocated. So right. that's the that's the big that's the big problem that that this thing sort of goes into. Right. No, and I I resonated so much when I read about the whirlwind because I've I've been on the receiving end where where someone higher up in the companies I've worked for right. has said, "Hey, we have this new strategic yes. initiative, th these goals that we're doing and and from my perspective it's like okay, well what you know, what do I need to drop?" From yeah, right. The, oh, we from the day that. to day, yeah, the day to day craziness, right? And so when you the, the whirlwind is a, it's a great way to describe it. So, okay, so let's let's get into the disciplines. Um, so discipline one is focusing on the wildly important, and and the principle behind it is the principle of focus. So I wonder if you might give, you know, maybe the key points of that discipline, and then I'm going to ask you how this might apply to my own situation. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. I think I want to start a little, let me give you a little anecdote. Um, gentleman by the name of Tim Tisopoulos is the president now of Chick-fil-A. When we knew him, uh, we know him now, but like when we spent a lot of time with him was about 20 years ago. And he was, we were working with him and he got involved in this early work around four disciplines with us. And he said something that never left us. Now, th this guy is the VP of operations for one of the most respected companies, particularly from an operational standpoint in the world. Like a, a freestanding Chick-fil-A will outproduce a McDonald's across the street five to one, working six days a week versus seven. These, these people are machines. He says this to us. He says, when I work with a new leader, he says, the first thing I want to know 
is where is that leader spending disproportionate energy? I don't want to know about seven priorities. I want to know, I want to know the one thing. I want to know where, what their, what's their big bet, what they're doubling down on. So when you think about narrowing the focus, don't necessarily go to the highest level goal in your life, right? If there's some high level, right, picture of success, right? If, if you're in sales, it's, it's revenue, right? All right. You know, if, if, you're in, if you're in manufacturing, right, maybe it's overall production, right? Like that, there's that overarching view of success, but that encompasses everything that you're doing. View that sort of like the title of a book. And then start looking at the chapters inside that book. And this is where, and by the way, the second edition of Four Disciplines is, is, is due out in April. And we're really explaining this principle better than we did in the first edition, I believe. The real key to focus is deciding which of the chapters is going to get, in Tim's words, disproportionate energy. Which one's going to get a special treatment? Right. So one way to think about this is if everything in my life held, so visually, if you sort of picture everything in the whirlwind, say if everything held, what's the one area where if I had a breakthrough, right, it would sort of, it would, it would have the biggest impact on everything else. And that's sort of the thought process as opposed to arguing what's most important. You do that, those priorities start behaving like crabs in a basket. The minute one of them starts to make it to the top, believe me, the others pull it back down. And so that's sort of the first idea about focus. The, the, the second, I, and you have to, by the way, you have to accept the fact that the day job is going to take about 80% of your energy. And the, you got to live the with whirlwind, that. right? Whirlwind, yeah. yeah. The, the priorities that you didn't pick to be the wildly important goal. And that you need to know this, one, because it's reality. And two, just because I didn't pick something as a wildly important goal does not mean that it's going to hell in a handbag. Like it's not going, like that's the thing you've got to, you only get to give special treatment to one thing. Everything else, that, that's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of time, right? But it's not getting the special treatment. The thing you define, and we use this term in discipline one as a wig or a wildly important goal, that just means it's going to get a special treatment. So which of the things Right, which of the priorities, which of the things that I'm working on, which of the objectives, the chapters in the big book of success is going to get disproportionate. So making that choice is sort of the first part of discipline one. And the second part is then putting it in the form of a target. Concepts don't execute. Concepts do not execute. Um, you know, so, so, so a concept being like, have better customer service. Yes, right? you got yeah. it. Yeah, you got it. And 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 uh, you know, really, and sometimes I have to say them as a concept because there's a lot to them. And it's we're going to be more. We're going to become trusted business advisors. Uh, we're going to be more consultative in our approach. We're going to and like I can talk about it for hours. And it's and it's you know it's this thing I've fallen in fallen in love with. Um, the the example that everybody seems to get quickest is lead the world in space exploration. Sounded like a target, but it wasn't, it was a concept. And, and NASA had 15 metrics for lead the world in space exploration in 1960. And Kennedy, and we weren't doing very good by the way, Sputnik, if you know the history, Sputnik's going around, we're blowing up rockets. Kennedy goes, um, we'll put a man on the moon by the end of the decade and return him safely home. Now, that didn't address directly a lot of the metrics of the 15 metrics under lead the world in space exploration, right? But it was this hard line executable target. And so now sometimes the concept easily goes like what you said about customer service. All right, well, we're at a, we're at a 74. We want to get from a 74 to a 90 by the end of the year. Like that went into a target quickly. Others, it's a little harder, but you have to go here. So we, we use this term, you know, from X to Y by when, or some people like starting line, finish line, deadline. So those are the, those are the two parts. You're sort, of, you're sort of pulling out from all the things that you've got to maintain. You're pulling out the thing you're going to give, as Tim Tatsopoulos would say, disproportionate energy to, and then you're putting it in the form of a target. And boy, Stephen, I think that applies 
on a personal level easily. Right. As much as it does on an organizational level, I, I could I could see that. And and by the way, the reason this is counterintuitive, because you will inevitably have to say no to good ideas if you choose this. And everyone, you're going to hate that, particularly if you're smart, creative, ambitious, right? The people, right. The type of people we promote, they, right? Like, like everybody loves the idea until it comes to doing it. And then when you have to do it, you, you, you don't have room for some really, and there's always more good ideas than there is capacity to execute. And you got to sort of be okay with that. Right. Yeah. This, this aligns so well, this, this principle of focus, wildly important goal with, have you have you read the book Essentialism by Greg McEwen, or heard no, of that? No, but I, okay. I haven't even heard of it. I like the title. It's it's a, okay. So we just we just released his episode on this podcast, and it oh, right literally on. yeah it aligns very very well with what you said. Where where this idea that that less can be more, and that it's actually harder to whittle down what are the essential things like what are the you know what yeah. are the wildly important so i think it, it it's really well and it and it's a little counter, counterintuitive because i know a lot of leaders are like okay well we've got 15 things we can't ignore them we have to you know we have to focus yes. on all these things right and and what we that's why we have to set up and we have to say look the four disciplines of execution is not a way to execute your entire job right it's not it's not a holistic operating system you have one of those because you're still breathing <laughs> you're, you're still made you're still in business you've got one of those what the four disciplines of execution is is a it's a rifle it's not a shotgun it's a breakthrough formula and i always think about this this model because because when we had years where we would talk about focus and we could just see leaders glaze over and here's what's <laughs> going on in their mind they're, they're, first of all we've never met a leader that doesn't say all the time we've got to prioritize we have got a narrow focus. It's like when you tell them to focus, they're thinking, yeah, no kidding. Like we said that yesterday, right? So that's the one thing they know is I got to focus. But the other thing they know is I got 20 things that need my immediate attention right now. And that that dichotomy, that conundrum, they just, they get, it's a very frustrating dilemma. But when you can help them think about it in these terms, right? That, okay, yes, 80% is life support, right? All your KPIs um, all your all your vital indicators are going to go in whirlwind and it's going to take up 80 percent. And then you're going to give this disproportionate strategic treatment in, in healthcare. When we introduce this idea in healthcare, they call it taking an issue to intensive care. There's lots of services around the hospital. There's only one intensive care unit. Right. So what issue in your life and your business, which patient are you going to take to intensive care? Let's take, and I know we're spending a lot of time on discipline one. Oh, I always good. do though. I always yeah, preload no, D1. Good. I love it. Um, if you so, get D one right, the others are easier. Yeah, if you right. miss this one, it's impossible, right? So the examples I want to use is I I have stewardship over a sales team uh, um, for across the country. Okay. Um, so that's the first one on a, on a professional level, and then yeah. from a the personal level one. And again, we don't need to. I know we could go in super depth with this, but yeah, 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 I want yeah, to yeah. keep it more high level. But on the on personal side, I have a goal. So so let's take the sales team first. So sales team, okay. would, would an example, a good example of of a wig, or is it is this too broad? I, I basically came up with, we, we want to increase revenue by twenty percent by December thirty first. Is that is that is that too high level? Yes. <laughs> okay. And, and it's my go to bad example. Thank okay, you. Okay. Good. <laughs> you, stepped, you stepped right into the trap. Perfect. I have a whole series of slides with that goal as a do not. And everybody steps in it. Like you just, I'm so sorry, Stephen. You just landed, but everybody does it. It's our fault. Like if you had read the second edition, like you wouldn't go there. Cause like we hit this thing right on the nose. So here's what I would say. That is your, that's the title of your book. The title of your book is that 20% close in sales revenue. Okay. okay. And so, so what I'd say is like, like, first of all, are there, there are certain stroke of the pen things that you can do. You've got new products maybe that you didn't have last year. You have a new marketing team. You got a new promotion that you're running. You got a bunch of stroke of the pen stuff. That's probably going to give you six or seven points on that 20% gap. Right. You got right. your day job, which has probably got a little positive inertia. So it's going to give you the, it's going to give you last year's goal and you know, it might give you another two or three points, just the momentum. 
Okay, so you might really, when you look at it, you really might be beyond inertia and stroke of the pen. You might have something like a 10 to 15% gap that you're trying to move on. Now you could just say, that's my goal, but we can do better. So here's what I would say. Is there, you ever met Jeff Wadsworth? Do you know Jeff? No, I, no, your, I don't. He's one of your dads and my dear friends. And Jeff loves Bachman Turner Overdrive. Uh, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet from Bachman Turner Overdrive. I saw Sean and Dave, two of your uncles, do a, do a karaoke to this, okay? Uh, in that song, there's this line where he says, any love is good loving, so I took what I could get. So we always tease sales teams, and we always go, hey, is any loving good loving? Is any revenue good revenue? So this comes from Jeff Wadsworth, is it, right? Is any loving good loving? Like, and so when you look at those, when you look at that gap of 10 to 15 points that you got to close, is any revenue good revenue? Or is there some products you really like? Are there some customers you really like, right? And right, I'll bet if you right. think about that, you've got a product, you've got a demographic. Oh, we keep these. Oh, the margins on this are great. Oh, we always get additional business. And could you close that 10% in that particular area? So just as I say that, sorry for the long tangent on BT. No, that's okay. <laughs> But now you'll remember it, right? Is yeah. Any love it, good love it, right? So what, what comes to your mind when I say that? Yeah, so it would be around, probably around a specific product type that has yep. the best, that has the best margin. Yep, that's what um, I thought. Yeah, that, so that would, now, yeah. Now you say, okay, we're going to improve, we're going to go from, uh, we're going to go from 3 million to 5.5 million in this particular product. Let's, let's close our gap with that thing. Now, by doing that, you see, you feel your focus narrow when you, when mm -hmm. you do that. Now, the whole conversation around discipline two, discipline three, discipline four changes dramatically. People right. that struggle with disciplines two, three, and four miss this focus component in discipline one. There's this counterfeit focus where, hey, it's just one goal. Be successful. No, that's every, if everything you're doing is contributing to that goal, you have not narrowed your focus. So there's that one. Okay. And then from, Sorry, from a, that was a super long, no, this, no, was a this is great. Long. Cause Did I can see. tell you I was going to have many. No, no. Gadgets and what I said. No, I love it though. But, but I, I think this is important. Like you said, because you have to get the first one right or else the next three probably don't make sense. So let's say from a personal level though, I yeah. have, so I have, I have a goal. Um, I want to improve my family culture, like as a family. I know that, that that's really broad. I mean, how how do you narrow something you got, like you that were just, down? You were, if I had if I had a week to tee up two examples, you you yeah. I think you just found them both. Okay, <laughs> the bad examples, right? Yes, so, yeah. so fantastic, man. <laughs> you went too high and you went too broad. Bless your yep. soul. Okay, all right. So let's talk about this. There is no one metric for improving family culture. This is a perfect example. I might steal this. So what you need is a good surrogate. Remember, concepts don't execute. Right. Targets execute. So the challenge is to think of something that if achieved would probably be a pretty good indicator that your family culture has has made a shift and and that's a tough one like i'd have to i it's always that we've never not been able to think of a of a specific um there was a there was a, in the in the book jamie downs uh talks about um wanting to improve her relationship with her daughter when she was uh, with one of her girls when and and she was having another baby and she was worried that she was going to be so consumed with this new baby and so she had a goal to walk a certain number of miles every week with this daughter and that goal, knowing, knowing that the time component, if achieved, would probably get her the other one, but the other one wasn't measurable. Right. Okay, so that's helpful, right? What's something that if the family achieved, you know, as a family, you know, you did X number of service projects for other families before the end of the year, or you you know, you achieved something for someone, depending on what kind of cultural jump, but you've got to go, you, you've got to make that jump. That's what I was talking about. So it's like, I said, there are two parts of discipline one. The, right. You, the first example nailed the first part, which is coming off the big goal. The second one, you nailed the second part, which is you got to move to a target. 
Very good, Perfect. Stephen. I don't know if it's good. It's just oh, yeah. it was excellent for the podcast. <laughs> no, th- no, this is this, this is great because these are two real things. And again, I think just reading it, that's probably how I'd approach it. But the way that you've been able to describe it um, makes a lot of sense. I can already think of some ideas of of how we could better measure it as a family. So that's great. Okay, good. I'm so, glad. I'm glad. Yeah, you'll have to so let this- me know. You'll have to let me know because that's a, that's a very worthy goal. How yes. many? Do you have, by the way, how many children? I've do you got have? four. I've got four kids. Not it- Hey, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. way. That, that might be I, it. I, I had seven because I was really hoping you're at some point your family would adopt me. And I figured, oh you know, gosh. seven habits, I could. <laughs> they always, when awesome. I bring it up, they always, they always change the subject when I bring it up. But I've try, tried. That's awesome. That's hilarious. Okay, so discipline two. So act on the lead measures. And this, the principle behind this discipline is the principle of leverage, right? Yeah. So. For me, uh, when I first was working, I would hear things like lag measure and lead measure. And I always just pretended I knew what people were talking about <laughs> for like for like five or six years. I was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. So did we. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and so I, I would love. I, yeah. So so why why act on a lead measure? So, you know, what what's what's a lag measure versus a lead measure? OK, so it, and leverage is the perfect thing. So the lag a result measure so that lagging means it's after the fact it's already been a result leading measures are the things that we can measure on our way to the result is the simplest way to sort of get your head around it but it's not until you talk about leverage that you really understand it a lever has two characteristics so just picture a, trying to move a rock with a lever like you get your little fulcrum right you got your lever the rock's too heavy to move you're trying to move this little rock in your front yard, you can't lift it, and you gotta get a steel pole under it, okay? Unlike the rock, the lever, I can move. I'm lifting the rock with the lever, right? The the lever is influenceable, the rock is not. So that's the first characteristic. People tend to think about leads and timing and, and, you know, that's not as helpful as, can I actually do this? If I put energy, I have to put focus against it. And then the second characteristic of a lever is it's predictive. When the lever moves, the rock moves. So if you just stay with those two ideas, don't look at a data. Here's what you don't do. Don't look at a data set and try and say, well, which are our lag and which are our leads? Uh, the cause and effect relationships will spin you in circles. Yeah. Instead, get to whatever the wildly important goal is, recognizing that part of that treatment we talked about is the lever, okay? And then for that particular lag measure, which happens to be a wildly important goal, right? Because you put it in the form of a target. Now say, okay, if we are going to get that, go back to your revenue example with that particular, those, you know, those product categories that you want to move. What's something that we can do if we put energy against it we can influence it and it's got direct output okay you know what there's a particular type of buyer and if you can get a meeting with this buyer there's about a one in four chance it will lead to a sale but this buyer has to be right they they've got to have a couple of their team members with them uh, you're going to need them. You're going to need at least a half an hour or it probably isn't going to be predictive. Right. And so the lead measure is we're going to get four buyer meetings as defined by dot, 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 real specific, right? Right. 10 yards for a first down, not nine. Now, like once we, once we know what the lead measure is and we're betting that if we can get four of those, we can get right. That'll translate to one new account. Okay, so it's, it's yeah, I think, uh, you know, just, just telling me to go out and land that product line, I don't know. But yeah, can I get that? Can I break it down to that meeting? Yeah, that I could do, right? And so this is kind of how the whole, di- and then you have to test it for predictive and you have to test it for influenceable. Now, some lead measures are like diet and exercise for weight loss. Like they just work. You just got to right. do them. Now you got to have, the, you got to have a lethal dosage, right? You got to have the right amount of exercise, the right amount of calorie burn, right? To get the weight loss, you got to figure that out, but you know, they work. Others, you're literally testing, but here's the good news on this, Stephen. That's where the engagement comes from. A lot of times not having the answer for the team 
is the best thing you can do to get them engaged. And it's a little bit of trial and error. It's a little bit of scientific method. So that's right. So, so, right. so your, your job as the leader of this team is to maybe come up with, pick the goal. You pick the wig, let them talk you out of it. If they can, if they think there's something better, but you make final decision on the wig, then give the team your best five or six guesses on lead measures knowing they're a little closer to the action than you are and, and let them make this pick. And then if they, if, if it's, if they feel it's their pick and it's not working, they'll change it or they'll tweak it. But you really want ownership from the team on a lead measure basis. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. So as I, if big picture, I, I look the way you describe it in an easy way is lag measure. If you're trying to lose weight, right. Lag measure is your weight you loss, that's right. It. That's, the weight loss, that's that's the lag because it, it comes at the end. But the lead measure would be the diet and the exercise. So it's something that you have influence over, right? And then, okay. that And it's predictive that, of the outcome, and right? And it's predictive. But here's, the, yep. here's the key. It has almost nothing to do with how much you know about diet and exercise. It has everything to do with whether you actually track it. Every one of your listeners that knows somebody that's lost 50 pounds, they were counting something that was predictive. Knowledge was not predictive. <laughs> you got to hold the ugly mirror up and realize: Did we do it this week or did we not do it this week? Okay, so then, and then that ties into discipline three, right? Which yeah, is see how quickly, see how quickly yeah. it moves now. And by the way, do you see how helpful it is to narrow that product? Because like, how hard would discipline two have been if it was just revenue? Right. That would have been a really hard jump to get something that was predictive without narrowing the focus more in discipline one. So, so discipline three, here's all I want you to think about with discipline three. Game on. Just, right, when, you know what I mean? When does it, when does it go game on? Like, okay, this is live. And, and in our experience, it doesn't, like you can talk to a team all day about hypothetically, if we did this, we could get that. And how many of these would get us one of those. But until, until the scoreboard goes live, like, behavior doesn't start to change. And, you know, people play very differently when they're keeping score. You can, you can look at a group of kids on a basketball court and if they're shooting around or if they're, have, if they're keeping score is immediately apparent. Even if you don't know basketball, no, they're keeping score. And so this is not keeping, this is not your corporate dashboard. This is not all the metrics in your whirlwind. This is very simple. This is a player's scoreboard, right? You as the leader, you know, Stephen, you might have a coach's scoreboard, right? Where you see all the data, but this is theirs. So it's just that product category you're trying to move the two lead, you know, the one or two key lead measures. And I got to see it in real time. Like, yeah. how are we doing versus where we are? And, and, and it's, it's a little harder to do than it sounds. And it, but, but again, getting the team involved in how you do it. We have an app for that. You can, you can just buy an app. And, and kind of follow those instructions. And then everybody's got it right on their phone. That's an easy way to do it. Um, but you, you, so disciplines one, two, and three, I like to think about like, that's setting up a high stakes winnable game, right? You took the most, you took the most critical single chapter in your success book and you built a high stakes winnable game just around that one thing. It's really good for morale because sometimes there's so many things that are out of your control that tends to discourage your team. And that's always gonna be there. But if there's one thing that the teams they can win at and it matters, much easier to keep morale on a team. One of the examples in the book that was mentioned is there was a one time a high school football game going and the scoreboard was down. And then the level of engagement from everyone was like, dropped everyone's like what the heck is going on so that that idea of a scoreboard that everyone can see and that your team um whoever's part of it has 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 a um you know they participate in coming up with the lead measures i you totally make sense how that could drive engagement so then okay so this tried to, yeah yeah have you ever tried to um have you ever tried to get one of your one of your children interested in football that's not interested in football you ever had any, I mean, like every once in a while, one of my girls will sit on the couch or, or my sons did the same thing. And they're like, okay, explain it. You spend an inordinate amount of time watching this stuff. What's right. going on? And like the first thing, no one will engage in football until they understand down and distance. 
Okay, this is their, the downs are tries, okay? They've got three tries. See that little yellow line? They got three tries to get to that yellow line. What you're doing is you're showing them the lead measure for the game. The lead measure is first downs. And if they get enough of those, it's influenceable and it's predictive and that, that moves the score, that moves the lag measure, right? But it's a perfect example. And not, let me tell you how perfect it is. The networks know this. That's why down in the corner, they wanna keep your eyes on their game. Third right. and five, 14. I don't even need to know who's playing. Third and five, 14 to seven, somebody needs a first down. You got me, right? So there's this human, you do this right. We didn't know this. You do this right. This en engagement comes along for the ride. That's, that's awesome. Okay, so discipline four, create a cadence of accountability. The principle behind it is accountability. So what, yeah, what, in the, in the few minutes we have, what would be, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, and I gotta what's give the props. key for this? This is this one. This one belongs to your uncle Sean. Sean is the one that nailed this one. And um, early on, right? Uh, this is the, okay. So if if discipline, if discipline one is the rock, discipline two is the lever, three is kind of how we see it. Discipline four is the notion of force against leverage. What do I do this week to ensure that no matter what we do, those lead measures? So let's go back to diet and exercise. Okay, uh, my lead measures really suffer when it rains outside because I don't like to run in the rain. I'm getting the gym membership this week. That's my commitment for the week. These are specific commitments that you make. I'm gonna get to Whole Foods and get that recipe and get those products because I've been eating garbage and it's killing my caloric intake, whatever, right? But there's something I'm gonna do this week that ensures that, that we are gonna make good, we're gonna pull the lever no matter what. Okay, we've got to get, okay, I've got two new people on my sales team. They don't understand how to set up these meetings. I'm going to model this with two of them. I'm going to go on a, you know, I'm going to go on that meeting with, with Maggie and I'm going to kind of model how that's done. And it's, and it's every week they change. It's very dynamic. The lead measures is we're going to hold that. We're going to keep pulling that lever till we see if it works. But the commitment, go back to the very, very beginning when we said urgency. Remember how the day job dominates? Mm -hmm. We're going to force some activities that, Without this cadence would not feel urgent. But now that I have to report on them the next week, so that cadence is this little 15 minute meeting the team holds every week and everybody commits to doing one or two things that are gonna pull, that are gonna make sure we can pull the lever this week. And then we got to report on it. And as the leader, here's the key. This has to feel serious. Like no, do, do not make this feel like preseason football. You know what I mean? Like, hey, guy, I know how busy you all are. And I know you hate having this meeting. Sorry to get you. No, no. Like you, what's important is really determined by the way leaders treat things. Do you start that meeting right on time? Okay. And then you report your commit. These were my commitments for next week. Tony, what you got? Oh, oh, I committed to this. I did a, I did a, I did a. somebody misses a commitment. You don't have to be a jerk. Just say, hey, um, Sue, if you get yourself in that situation again next week, will you call me and I'll help you on that commitment? She will never call you and she will never miss another commitment. <laughs> right? And, but, but here's the key. Commitments have to come from them. Right. Not from you. So you're pulling their innovation, their ideas, their initiative into a scoreboard they help create. Right? This is, this is their game. They got to play the game, but it's their game. So discipline one's counterintuitive because you got to say no to good ideas. Discipline two is counterintuitive because we always fixate on lags, not leads. Discipline three is counterintuitive because we like to make coaches scoreboards with lots of data. We need those, but this is going to be a player scoreboard. And discipline four is counterintuitive because the commitments have got to come from them. Awesome. No. Up. This is great. I know we could spend all day diving into this. So I'd encourage everyone to, to jump into this book. Also YouTube, Chris McChesney, you can find Woo! great video, great <laughs> videos of him doing it. So, so Chris, before we leave, there's two quick questions I ask at the end of yeah. every podcast. The right first on, one right is, on. the first one is rock group. I think we cover this Bachman Turner. Overdose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah there ahead. you go. So, so uh, the first one is what is one practical action step a listener could take to execute better in their life? I know we've, talked about this a lot, but if you were to just give one practical action step. It's the ones I gave to my son-in-laws and my adult kids this year, which was pick one achievement this year that really scares you a little bit, right? Love it. It's, 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 there's no downside risk, but 
to do it scares you a little bit. Pick pick one target that gives you a little bit of butterflies in your stomach. That's perfect. And then the last and then, question. And then it'll, oh, it'll pull. It'll pull the other disciplines along with it because if you get serious about it, you know, you'll have to do the other stuff. Yep. And then the last question, and I ask this to everyone, is it pretend or imagine you were sitting one-on-one -on -one with someone who was starting out in their career and they asked you about success, you know, what it is, um, how to be successful. How, how would you approach that? Now, you, you could probably, I know you, Chris, I know that you could probably spend a day on this, but succinctly, what would you say to someone starting off in their career asking you about that? What is success? How to be successful? All right. I'll, I'll give you one thought on this thing. Peter Drucker said the hardest thing to get people to do is to think about their job in terms of results instead of activities. Ask somebody about their job and they describe a series of activities that they do. They rarely talk to you about the result they create. Switching, and this is a conversation I've had with my adult kids, switching your mindset from doing a job to creating results. Start to think about your career in terms of the currency of results. Right? I need, like, like bank those results. We cut project delivery time from X to Y, not we completed X number of projects, right? We right, start to find the operational opportunities for creating results and deal in the currency of results. Forget your career planning. I'm sorry. Forget it. It's way too dynamic. You create results and let the universe pull you. It will. Brilliant. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Chris. This was mind-blowing and insightful today. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> your, your energy, your energy right is there. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, you, were, you were pitching softballs. Like, you, you had the right examples. That was, that was super helpful. Yeah. No. Well, thanks again, Chris, so much uh, for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Stephen. This was great.